Thanks for joining us, Matt. How are you doing? I'm really well. Thank you for having me on. No, thanks for coming on. Um, your new book, uh, Politically Homeless, um, you've been a Labour supporter for many years. Before we kind of get into why that is, uh, do you feel now under Keir Starmer you're starting to get what you would say was your party back? Um, well, I don't know. It's not really my party anymore. I left five years ago. I'm not sure I would ever rejoin it. Um, just because I don't think I would ever join any political party again. So I think Keir Starmer's a step in the right direction, but it's from such a low bar that just the, just being able to speak properly, be fairly sensible and competent is now seen as a kind of luxury for a Labour leader, but they are the basics, so it's good that they're those boxes are now ticked. And I think he's professional and pragmatic and impressive and a better candidate for Prime Minister than Boris Johnson, but the Labour Party itself is a... It's a kind of, it's still part of the equation and COVID has kind of paused any conversation we're really having about where the party stands and what the party wants and his relationship with it and what Labour will offer at the next election. So that's all to come. And I, I still worry about that. Uh, Matt, you're obviously a very successful comedian, a writer, but what is it that actually got you into politics in the first place? Why did you choose to join the Labour Party? And you just mentioned that you don't think you'll join a party ever again. What's changed? What makes you think you can't ever rejoin a political party after you left five years ago? Well, what got me into politics? I grew up um, you know, in a single parent family and on benefits in inner city Nottingham towards the you know, I was born in 1982, so Thatcher and major governments. And um, it was not just our sort of economic situation that I thought was unfair, but the moralising towards single mums especially, I've, I've just always thought was mad. Like, even as a kid, I thought, well, my mum's the one who's stayed to raise us. Like, shouldn't absent parents be the ones that get the moral opprobrium? So I think um, I, I had a kind of reaction against in a very you know as much of an ideological reaction as you can have at about the age of seven eight or nine but I remember Thatcher going and what a big deal that was for people on our street and then I remember Labour almost went in in 1992 and it I think just from a young age I realized that politics is the way you sort the world out and of course there are many other ways but really if you want to affect real change it's getting elected now obviously I, those those ideas, you know, become more articulate and and coherent as you go through life. But just from a young age, I thought, well, the world's not fair, and I, you know, someone has to do something about it. Um, I joined the Labour Party because at the time I perceived them to be the best way to sort the country out. I was hugely inspired by Tony Blair. I was fourteen when he became Prime Minister, and I just was uh, threw myself into the Labour Party. Became an activist, became a member of staff, worked in it for so long. Um, but to answer your final question now, I mean. All political parties are mad. <laughs> and, and, and this is true of every mainstream party. There's some really clever people in there. Most of them are genuinely motivated out of a sense of public service and, and want to make the world a better place. But they are, they're crackers. And they're eccentric and they're difficult. And every leader is just trying to basically keep the party sane. And that is just an exhausting process to be a part of. And so I think even if Labour got itself back to a kind of new Labour position or progress wing were in charge or whatever you would call it, um, I could vote for it again, but I don't think I would ever put myself back into it because I, I just find it, the, the inability to learn the most simple lessons, and this again goes for every political party, drives me mad. And it's not, I don't care about the party enough to want to go back into that. You, you say, you mentioned that you're a fan of Tony Blair, that comes across, I think he's the quote on the front of your book, I think. Oh, uh, yes, is that yes, right? he is. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. That went down well on Twitter. I was going to say, gonna say it's, like you're, it's like you're poking them with a stick. Look, <laughs> he's on the front of the book as well. Um, um, but how, how, how much... I put it to you, Mr. Ford, that part of your probably um, like for New Labour was what? Well, so I'm, I'm front of the math. You were probably what 16, 17 when Tony Blair came to power. 14. Uh, yeah. You were at 14. <laughs> sorry, when you 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 were f not Nottingham Forest. Were, uh, you're a fan of. We're still doing all right. Yeah. Oasis were top of the chart. Oh. Big fan of Oasis. How much of <laughs> how much of that kind of era and your sort of affection for Tony Blair in that era was also kind of wrapped up in the fact that you were at that age where life was pretty good as well? Or am I just reading too much into that? No, I think that's a really good question. And it's something I talk about in the book is you have to be really careful with nostalgia that you don't just want to repeat the past identically. 
I think I was really lucky to grow up. I think all of us who were kind of uh, can remember the 90s in any proper way were really lucky because it was the last time the economy really boomed. Uh, you know, it was the dawn of the Premier League. Euro 96 was hosted in England. England did well in it, could have won it. And then you had the explosion of New Labour, Britpop and all that. It all happened at the same time. And really, that hasn't happened since. We haven't had an economic era as prosperous as that. We haven't had a, a kind of national music scene that was so defining and so rich and broad and deep as we, we had then. So it was a lucky time to grow up. But my politics aren't um, wedded to that era. It's just a coincidence that all that happened, really. And I think, uh, you know, had Tony Blair come along 10 years later, I'd have still agreed with him. That's interesting. I mean, after Blair, we've had several Labour leaders, one of which that you're not particularly uh, a fan of, Jeremy Corbyn. Um, and you obviously left the party, like you mentioned. What is it about Jeremy Corbyn? What was it about that wing of the party and the way in which they led the party that made you say, no, this is enough for me. This is the moment I will quote. Because you're quite clear in saying that you think political parties are nuts, like everyone there is mental. So what was it about Jeremy Corbyn in particular that sort of pissed you over the edge? I'd kind of been halfway out the door during the Ed Miliband years, to be honest. I, th I thought it was just tiresome kind of indulging in this fantasy that somehow you can shift Labour to the left and try and win. And it really made me question the sense, really, um, of the people that had led that project. Because I thought, you know, this is going to... If you don't realise you're going to lose this, how, how can you have had more time in politics than me at a more senior position, come from that amazing political background and not realise this really simple lesson? So that frustrated me. And then when, when Corbyn got became leader, I left on the day he became leader because I dealt with people like Jeremy Corbyn before when I'd worked for the Labour Party. And he's a, he's a, there's a type and they, are, they pose as kind of genteel people of peace. They talk a great game, but actually that masks a really authoritarian outlook, um, a really dangerous view of Britain's history and Britain's role in the world. And a completely, you know, the, the things they're prepared to tolerate aren't peaceful at all. And they were often involved in kind of, frankly, bullying behaviour at local party meetings. I'd, I'd, I knew the type inside out and I'd seen the way that his campaign had run and the tone of how it had really been conducted. I thought it was repellent and I didn't think it was Labour either. You know, there's this misconception about what traditional Labour values are and the, number, the reason the Labour Party was formed and wasn't just another trade union or think tank was to explicitly was to win elections and anything you do that departs from that is a betrayal of the fundamental Labour values. So I just thought the whole thing is far too left-wing for the Labour Party. That's not moderate democratic, um, you know, social democracy or democratic socialism. So I just thought this, is, this party is about to change in a profound way and I don't even want to give it 40 quid a year. So uh, I left. <laughs> And, and do you not think Keir Starmer is a kind of? I mean, you obviously you said before that Keir Starmer is a sort of step in the right direction, but but for you, it's still not enough. Uh, effectively, is it someone of the Tony Blair wing of the party? Effectively, kind of right of centre within the Labour Party that you think is the only chance they've got of winning an election again? Well, I think the jury's out on Keir Starmer, and this is the thing, really, is that he is uh, he's more than a step in the right direction. Like it's a hop, skip, and a jump, really, like away from Corbyn. Like it's the first time Labour can say they've got a better candidate for Prime Minister, I think, for 10 years, and that's really important. He had an important national job before then. You know, all the things that people were anxious about Corbyn, I don't think they apply to Keir Starmer. So it's really important, that. And um, he's professional and he's serious and he's good at it. So all those things are, are really crucial. But as for the party itself, that's a, that's a totally different thing and whether he's capable of moving the party to a, to a more moderate position and also what he stands for is yet to really be fleshed out i get the sense that he's a moderate labor guy he's nowhere near as um hardcore as corbyn but precisely where he stands is yet to really be defined and i think you know ultimately it's good that he's competent and that he's talented but the politics behind that really matter as well and i kind of i guess I'm tentatively seeing how it goes mm. so you've you worked in politics you've now gone to a point where you are writing jokes, you're doing impressions, often about politicians. How difficult have you found that transition and how difficult is it now to satirise politicians? Because we're seeing a new type of politician from what we saw in the 90s. You've gone from sort of quite a slick operator in uh, Tony Blair and David Cameron to someone who is quite different in Boris Johnson. In terms of your comedy, how hard has it been to transition across? Well, I always did comedy on the side. So I did my first gig when I was 16. So I was kind of, I was just throwing myself into everything at that age. I joined the Labour Party. I was trying out comedy on the side. So I'd always done it parallel to my political career. But when I was working in politics, 
I didn't have the time. I also probably didn't think it was appropriate to be being a stand up on the side of being a like you know, an advisor or a staffer. So as I, as I start to move away from politics, I started doing it more when I moved to London about 10 years ago. So the transition was okay, actually. It kind of, luckily, um, I was able to give up the day job and just sort of move into comedy and radio quite, quite easily at that point. Um, as for impersonating the modern lot, I mean, obviously Keir Starmer's highly professional. So he's a kind of return to uh, that type of politics. And obviously Blair, even though he was slick, had quite big mannerisms and, you know, a lot of body language and could, you know, a lot of range actually in terms of, you know, someone that you can impersonate. Yes, it's right, by the way, that we not only invest in the NHS, but reform it. And as for the people <laughs> opposite, you know, there was a lot of, there was a lot to go off on Blair. So even though he was slick, there was still, and Brown obviously is this, a completely different figure than Prescott. Whereas, yes, of course, Boris Johnson is a very different character to Tony Blair and is more, cultivated more of a kind of eccentric and it's all deliberate but that deliberately shambolic exterior so um boris is really fun to impersonate is, is the short answer is just in terms of it's more fun to do silly voices and he's got a really daft kind of manner about him so are you i know you pay tribute to you uh, you need to greet i uh, do a podcast uh, but it's great to be uh, you know really is. and then uh, you know i'm a uh, couple uh, you, 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 i give way to the honorable uh, member for Oh, yeah, I give you. Uh, and you, the sort of mumbling and all that shit is kind of, that's really fun to do. You know, <laughs> taking his politics out of it, he's great fun to impersonate. I mean, impressions are one thing, but I mean, do you think satire is now so much harder than it was when Spitting Image was first on? We should mention, by the way, that Matt is on Spitting Image, which has returned. Uh, mm. and he does, does the voice of Boris Johnson and Keir Starmer and Donald Trump and we're definitely going to let you make you do them in a minute yeah. but do you think do you think do you think satire is harder now than it was in the early 90s when you consider that I mean someone like Donald Trump and to an extent Boris Johnson they're kind of beyond satire I mean Donald Trump how do you satirise Donald Trump I mean you see, I remember Armandi Anucci was it when he's always asked well you bring back the thick of it and he's like well the thick of it's now just real life and beyond <laughs> that, how do you do it well, I think satire and political comedy always exist in relation to the landscape of the time. So Thatcher was a big figure. Yeah. And Thatcher was kind of otherworldly, kind of strange, eccentric yeah. being, Maggie Thatcher. Um, and, and, you know, people thought when George W. Bush was around, things couldn't get even more berserk. And now compared That's to Trump, true, like yeah. George W. Yeah. Bush is, you know, people yearn, people yearn for, for W. to come back. Um, and they look more fondly on that period in office, perhaps. So it's always, you know, there's always challenges in terms of whether they're too eccentric or not. You know, a lot of people actually, it was during the coalition years, that was like when it was seen as really thin gruel. People were like, who wants to see political comedy about Nick Clegg and, and David Cameron and Ed Miliband? Whereas now, because of Brexit, Boris, Corbyn, Trump, Scottish independence, you know, these really big issues and these really sort of different characters that it seems to have brought out, the public are far more tuned in. Like, there's never been a better time for Spitting Image, really, because there's such an appetite to see these people lampooned, yeah. mocked and teased, um, that it it kind of cuts both ways. That, obviously, if, if these people mm. are more ridiculous, then you have to be more... But, you know, you have a lot of creative freedom on a show like Spitting Image to tease them in different ways. I think, the, I think in a way, it's a, a great time because the public are just so desperate to see these people ripped. Mm. Matt, can I ask you to put on your Donald Trump hat and I'm going to ask you a question as if you are the US president. Um, I actually do have a MAGA hat here that I use for like, you know, you are, videos you're welcome to, I won't literally put it on. <laughs> you're welcome to put it on if you want to. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a prop, not yes, your own it's prop. A prop. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's not, <laughs> I'm not that right. <laughs> um, <laughs> president Trump, um, you're quite far behind in the polls. Uh, the debates have been fairly interesting for us to watch. You've just come out of hospital with coronavirus. What do you are, what are you expecting in the upcoming election? We're going to win. I know we're going to win. We're going to win very beautifully and very big. And I got to tell you, and you, your buddies there, Good. Davey Howitt and <laughs> Shaquille Sadiq Khan, I got to tell you both, <laughs> you're a pair of losers. And I, I don't know why I agreed to do your, your little podcast for the BBC or whoever you do it for. You're part of the fake news media, and that's why you don't understand, because I would tell you both this. And I hope you're listening, by the way. We will win, and I don't care whether we win officially or unofficially, but I'm telling you right now, we're going to win big, 
And you two losers, you will be apologizing to me in a few weeks' time. Oh man! It was the, anyone watching this on the YouTube video? Were, uh, sorry, and listen on the podcast won't see the hands. The hands got me there. That was, <laughs> it's, that, it's the little. It's these little just moments. I love. And how hard? I mean, the classic question you ask people to do impressions, but how hard? How easy? Boris Johnson, Keir Starmer. I mean, Keir Starmer must be quite difficult in a way because it's not particularly obvious and in a way he's actually quite i was driving back from manchester on monday uh, tuesday it doesn't matter and um on five live Keir Starmer sounded like ed Miliband a little bit yes on the that's radio. really that's a really good they both sound like they've got a block quite nose. nasally yeah yeah uh, so uh, look ed Miliband sounded like that um you know the tories just don't get it you know come on <laughs> they don't get it and i always thought ed Miliband sounded quite camp actually oh come on <laughs> The Tories just don't get up. And that's what we're really <laughs> thing that you do. Whereas Keir Starmer also has a blockage. So he kind of, I think as well, it helps to think about the sort of things they say and then that kind of helps the voice come. So Starmer just says stuff it's impossible to disagree with at the moment, which is quite, you know, smart in one way. But go, yeah, Mr. Speaker, I remind the Prime Minister, we agree with the government where they get it right. I must point out, but we disagree with the government when they get it wrong. <laughs> I can't make this clear for the Prime Minister. He, just, well, of course, like, he makes it sound like he's a really like grand position, but it's really straightforward. But he has a quite a sort of grand, even with the blockage, quite a grand sound, so that kind of helps. Who, who's your favourite politician to impersonate? You've got several that you can do. Who's the one that you enjoy doing the most? I think Hague and Blair were a lot of, I think with... William Hague, even though he's not been around for quite some time, is the the joy <laughs> of the depth and the sound that he made. You know, again, it's like if it was a funny voice anyway. So to, if you crack yeah, it, it's lovely. Yeah. And it was only when I met him that I realised he kind of, hmm, there's a kind of hmm in between hmm, the words hmm, that he's saying. Of course, I hmm, kind of hums away to himself. And I'd never picked that up from radio oh, or good. telly. So you can sort yeah. of just then incorporate that. And uh, it sort of means there's a sort of hmm, continuous kind of noise coming out. But he's got a, and he, what he's really good at as well, he uses his voice for maximum delivery. So like his jokes are really helped by the way that he uses his voice to deliver them. And that is like, you're kind of in Kevin Bridges territory then because you realise you've got a funny voice and you kind of weaponize it to make your words mm. even better. And Haig is fantastic. I think I did Blair earlier, but, you know, I think, frankly, you know, I, what I quite liked was the, look, yes, it's right. You know, there's all that sort of thing. And look, I think where Labour's gone wrong, actually, over the last sort of five or ten years is to fundamentally misunderstand. And it, actually, when you do the voice, you can then think like them. And then, of course, that with Blair, you know, you had the kind of the big stuff. Yes, it's right. A new nation reborn around shared values that we all agree with. You know, so you could do the really big stuff and then you could do the, well, I, I, you know, come on. I, 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 which is slightly boring to you, you know, I mean, yeah. um, But I guess blokes from a similar background can have kind of, you know, verbal tics that are in, uh, in common. I mean, Rishi Sunak's probably the newest one I've got. Yeah, I'll, I'll go on. I'm, I'm interested by that one. Yeah, go on. Well, I think he sounds a bit Ed Miliband. You know, when you first hear him, you think, is he kind of Tony Blair? He's kind of in that, you know, the, the, so many of these voices are actually in quite a small um, cluster. They all sound quite similar. Again, I think Rishi Sunak is part Ed Miliband, part Blair, and slightly, I think it's a campness, whatever it takes. And he sounds almost like a high-pitched, he's how people used to do Tony Blair, but whatever it takes... We will give you lots of money. And I think there's a kind of like, <laughs> I think there's a campness to Rishi Sunak that's quite attractive. Uh, um, we could chat to you all day about this, but I, we, we haven't, you, you, you're a very busy man, so I really, really appreciate <laughs> oh, your time. Um, I think my final question really is, you, you, must, you, you must pinch yourself at the moment because, I mean, as, a, as, as someone who like loves politics and is really interested in politics, uh, it's just the perfect time to also be a comedian. <laughs> and because, because the, as you said, the, the appetite is there. People have been watching these press conferences now for weeks and weeks and months and months. And the kind of the engagement in political debate sort of maybe started by Brexit has kind of flowed into COVID. If for you, it just must be like a dream, this. You get to write a book and be on Spitting Image and, 
and it just must be great. Spitting image is incredible. I mean, that's a yeah. real moment in life, really, because... I've been doing political impressions for the last few years and touring around the UK and Boris and Trump really became the centerpiece of the last two or three tours. And they were the, I would save them to the end and kind of do a big ending where it was those two. And it was just so much fun to do. And um, it was almost like bands having like a sort of hit song. You're like oh, Boris and Trump at the end, you know, you, there's nowhere to, that's what, that for me was almost like ending on Don't Look Back in Anger. You know, like once they've played that, you can't do any material after that. It's sort of gig over. Once you've done Trump, you can't then go, oh, let's do a bit of Keir Starmer. You're like, the gig has to end on Trump. So that was always like, it builds this big finish. So that's just been so much fun anyway. But for then Spitting Image to come back at a time where I'd really worked these impressions up and, you know, been writing material as the pair of them for so long, it, 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 it's just a, a, an amazing moment that I then get to work on, to write on Spitting Image and then to voice those puppets is just... It's the most fun I've ever had at work. It's incredible. Um, you know, there's something really satisfying about writing these things, voicing them in this spare room that I'm talking to you now. I've done it all from home on this microphone and then turning on the telly on Saturday and you see, you know, my voice coming out of their mouths. You know, it's bonkers. It's a really cool thing. I don't think it's kind of fully sunk in yet. Uh, Matt Ford, we really appreciate your time. Thanks very much. Oh, thank you so much for having me on. Cheers. <laughs>